All right, gentlemen, this is section two of chapter two, dealing with statistics and models. Um, I'm going to briefly go over the basics of statistics with you and define models as they are defined in science and as they are used. Um, I think there will probably be a couple of uh, Khan Academy videos that you will watch as well to help bolster the information on statistics. Um, this is really just uh, following up on our discussion of uh, the scientific method or experimental method and the use of uh, statistics to analyze data. So this is not a statistics course. We are not going to go into uh, statistics in any great detail, but there are just a handful of basic uh, aspects that I want you to be uh, at least somewhat familiar with. And this lists the different models that we'll look at as well. Again, uh, be familiar with these objectives. Uh, these are good questions uh, or bits of information to use for the oral quizzes. All right, so what are statistics? Statistics is the collection and classification of data that are in the form of numbers. Okay, uh, the, the easiest way for me to explain uh, statistics in a way that most of you guys would be familiar with um, are sports stats. Okay, everybody who follows a sport is generally familiar with the stats of that sport. Uh, stats is just shorthand for statistics. We don't talk about sports statistics. We talk about sports stats. But um, when you're looking at stats, you're you're basically just um, collecting and classifying the data in numbers of athletes performance. Uh, when I grew up uh, I was most involved with baseball and I'm most familiar with uh, typical baseball stats. Um, and, and when you break it down or you look at the the back of a of a Topps baseball card you basically see a table there um, with all the different statistics. And so you know it, it's 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 easier to write that a, a, a particular batter's um, batting average in a season was 300, right, 0 .300, uh, zero, zero, as opposed to writing, you know, he hit the ball three out of ten times up or whatever number out of whatever number uh, for his amount of at-bats uh, would equal that 300 batting average. Um, so really, it's when you're looking at stats and you're and you're studying sports stats, that's that's what you're studying. Um, scientists very often are using lots and lots of numbers, uh, lots and lots of really big numbers, or lots and lots of really small numbers, and so it makes sense for them to use uh, statistics to summarize all those numbers and to characterize and to analyze and to compare uh, the data that they are referencing. Uh, it's a branch of mathematics. It's, it's a specific branch of mathematics. You can take a class or classes in statistics. Um, scientists need to be familiar with this math because at the research level, they will be using the tools of statistics to analyze and understand their data and to not only analyze and understand it themselves, but to report it in statistical terms to other scientists who will then analyze it and understand it in terms of the stats that are used. And what scientists do are they're going to use stats to describe populations. We call these statistical populations. It's a group of similar things that a scientist is interested in learning about. So they're not going to apply statistics to a bunch of disconnected things. Okay, When they apply statistics to something it's the, the, the data is all connected, and so that's called a population to reference the fact that it's all connected. The first is average. Um, statistical populations are composed of similar individuals, but the individuals have different characteristics. And so we can record uh, that as an average, as, as opposed to recording all of their individual characteristics. So the other term for average is mean, and it's the number obtained by adding up the data of a given characteristic and dividing this sum by the number of individuals. So, so here's an example. Uh, let's say you're doing a study uh, on, on males between the age of male 
physical development between the age of 14 and 19, and you've got 100 different uh, males that you've studied over the course of a couple of years, and, and each year you, you, you measured their height as, as proportional to their development uh, during, during puberty. Um, well, you could report all of their height. You know, that's 100 different data points. Or because in year one, all of those guys uh, were in the same population, you could report their average height, right? Add up, add up all of their, you know, take each guy's measurement uh, in centimeters or meters, right? Because it's science, so we use the metric system. You add them all up, and then you divide by 100 because it was 100 different guys, and you get the average height. And then year two, when they turn 15, you do the same thing. You get the average height. Compare the average height from year one to the average height from year two, which is a lot easier okay, uh, than comparing 100 different heights from year one to 100 different heights from year two. And then do the same thing when they turn 16, same thing when they turn 17. And that's how we would use the mean or the average in, in a beneficial way in, in analyzing data. It provides a single numerical measure for a population and allows for easy comparison. Distribution is the next. Distribution is the relative arrangement of the members of a statistical population. It's shown in a graph. So where does everybody fall? If we wanted to show the distribution of the, the 100 guys again at 14 of their heights, we would plot each individual height on a graph. Okay, 100 guys. So you would, on your, the x-axis of your graph, and I'll show you this in class, on the x-axis of your graph, you would put the height, or I'm sorry, you would put each guy, okay? On the y-axis, you would put the different heights, and then you'd go for guy one, and you'd plot his height, and then guy two, and plot his height. And that gives you an idea of how the, the heights are distributed amongst that population of guys for that 14 year, right, that year 14, when they were 14. And you can actually turn it into a shape. Um, and then next year you would do the same thing. Um, what happens with distribution is that in terms of populations, um, it generally the shape is going to form a bell curve. And you'll see a picture of this. It's lower on the ends. You know, it's higher in the middle. And, and the reason it forms a bell curve is because statistically, usually in populations, most of your people end up falling in what we call the average place. Okay, And you get outliers who, in terms of height, are really, really tall. And outliers who, in terms of height, are uh, really, really short. Okay, and and that's why those are lower, and you end up you end up with this with this bell-shaped curve. Okay, and in terms of us looking statistically at distribution, a bell-shaped curve always indicates what we consider a normal distribution. That is, um, the data is is symmetrical around the average. You have about the same amount of people who are above average as you have who are below average. And that's considered a normal distribution. Okay, this um, this shows uh, a bell curve or a relative bell curve in size distribution of dwarf wedge muscles. And notice how you have the length on the x-axis, um, and you have the number of muscles on the y-axis. Okay, I think I think I switched that when I was discussing height. So guys, we would, in terms of height of, of, of this example, I'm using the length in centimeters, or the height, I'm sorry, in centimeters will be on the x-axis, and the individuals will be on the y-axis. And if you plot all those out, and then you draw a line, you get a bellish shaped curve. And that would be considered normal distribution. Most, in this case, most of your muscles fall in the middle between, between 25 and 35 millimeters in length. And then you have a fairly symmetrical distribution around that in the middle. 
and then in statistics we talk about probability probability is the likelihood that a possible future event will occur in any given instance of that event so so we can determine probability uh, it's expressed as a number between 0 and 1 written as a decimal so we don't write it as a fraction in science with probability we don't write it as a fraction we don't say there's a 1 in 10 chance of that happening okay in science we don't write it as a percentage uh, we we generally write it as a decimal and read it and understand it as a decimal okay um, but in order to to get probability and this goes back to how we do our experiment you have to have a large enough sample size in order to to have what we consider valid um, valid re results and so you know if, if, if you have three guys that you're testing in your height okay or three uh, samples in your experiment that's that's not enough to come up with a pro probability or or have what we considered viable uh, results so you have to have enough uh, samples in your experiment now this idea of understanding the news the reason that we talk about this um, is because we don't really in society spend a lot of time trying to understand statistics but what happens is when the news reports things it reports statistics all the time uh, the example that's given here if a if firefighter says I'm sorry in, in, in a news report it, it states a study shows that forest fires increase air pollution in the city last year uh, that that is a particular statement based on a particular uh, set of data that has been statistically analyzed um, and then what you could do is you could gather and graph the data on pollution levels for the last 20 years and look to see if the year seems unusually high the news report when news reports science it doesn't ever report the whole picture and so it doesn't report everything that goes into the statistical analysis but if we understand statistics better we can understand better what is behind what is being said and reported to us okay now for example a study shows that forest fires increased air pollution in the city last year and that says a particular thing but that air pollution that increased last year may be lower than it was five years ago okay and statistical analysis kind of paints the whole picture in terms of results the other thing we can talk about is risk okay we already defined probability risk is the probability of an unwanted income outcome right so if we if we uh, discuss risk it, it we always need to think of that in, in in negative terms especially in terms of how things are reported um, so for example here people often worry about big oil spills um, in terms of oil pollution big spills only make up 5.2 percent right offshore drilling only makes up two percent pretty small statistically speaking in terms of the amount of oil pollution that's there um, but routine ship maintenance actually creates almost one-fifth 19.4 percent of oil pollution comes from just routinely working on big ships more than half of oil pollution comes from uh, runoff from the land every time we drive our cars on the highway if, if you've ever been driving on the highway and it's raining you see it it looks it looks uh, like there's kind of this oily slick right in the middle of the lane that you're driving in that's called the drip the drip line uh, every vehicle almost every vehicle even new vehicles um, are dripping oil and transmission fluid these are all oil products and they all drip down the center of the lane um, that stuff is constantly running off as it rains it runs off and and that creates over half of oil pollution um, in the environment uh, the reason I point this out to you is because you know in terms of risk there are many politicians media so on and so forth who make a big big deal out of big oil spills out of offshore drilling um, creating oil pollution when statistically 
those things that get the big media coverage because they're big and they draw attention um, don't put out nearly as much oil pollution as what our everyday use of vehicles or ship maintenance does. Um, so, so it's just important to try to think about and understand these things in, in clear terms. Um, you know, another example of risk, just as an example of understanding statistically what, you know, how it plays out, uh, the most important risk we consider is the risk of death. And, and so what happens? People think about the sensational types of things, the risk of dying in a plane crash, um, which is statistically much, much lower than the risk of dying from common causes, okay? Um, so we, we need to, again, this is just a corrective in how we think about and apply uh, a lot of these things. All right, let's talk about models, and then we'll finish, we'll finish this up. Um, models, by definition, are patterns, plans, representations, descriptions designed to show the structure or workings of an object, system, or concept. Okay, that's a big, long definition. Basically, models show us something that we can't see easily or we can't understand easily. Okay, so we can think of models like as, as an object lesson, and there's different kinds, and scientists use models all the time, and I want us to really zero in on understanding this use of science or this use of models within science, because I think that is hugely misunderstood today, and again, this is one of those things that really impacts some of the cultural scientific debates that are going on because we misunderstand how models are used in science. Especially when science is talking about things that can't be observed and can't be repeated. Right? So this takes me back to my earlier discussion about science and, and, and the science of origins. Right? In terms of origins, we can't observe it and we can't repeat it. And so that whatever science we discuss in terms of origins, we must needs be looking at models, ways of explaining something that we can't see. Okay? And so I want you to really work through this and try to understand this because it's going to impact some discussions we have in some video we watch. First are physical models. These are three-dimensional models that you can touch. This is like, you know, if you do model building. When I was a kid, I, I built a model Corvette. I built uh, a model of the Starship Enterprise, okay? Uh, uh, these are things that, you know, in, in the biology classroom, there's a model of the torso of a human. There's a model of the heart, uh, there's a model of the brain. These are three-dimensional, physical. You can touch them, you can move them around in space. Um, they closely resemble the object or system they represent. They may be larger or smaller, right? So uh, if I built a model of a Corvette, I built a scale down model, okay? Um, if we put in our classroom a model of the solar system, that's a scaled down model. If you build a model of a water molecule, okay, if you're doing atomic modeling, then you're doing a scaled up version, okay? So these physical models can be larger or smaller. Um, we saw in the video one of the most famous physical models it was the discovery of the structure of DNA built based on the size, shape, and bonding qualities of DNA. I think students today miss this when we see that double helical uh, strand of DNA. It's not like Watson and Crick saw this and drew it. They were, they were applying all kinds of knowledge of bonding and angles of bonding uh, in atoms and in the math of that to actually predict what shape DNA must be in based on the bonding and the, the mathematics and the understanding of bonding. And so that's really, really pretty fascinating when you boil that all down. Um, and then understanding that model and that shape led to us understanding lots of other things like DNA replication. 
Next type are graphical models. Maps and charts are what we would consider graphical models. Um, show things such as posi position of the stars, amount of forest cover in a given area, depth of water in a river along uh, a coast. Um, those are all graphical models. Conceptual models. Conceptual models are verbal or graphical explanations of how a system works. So if, if I were to draw in pictures and word boxes um, the Krebs cycle on the board, that would be a graphical model. Flow charts. So if I were to do, like when we do ecology, we'll do food webs. Uh, that, that's an example of a conceptual model. Uh, and we'll show you in the next page here um, what a what a flow chart looks like. So very simply, boxes with words of explanation, arrows telling you what uh, direction things go in. So in this case, this is a conceptual model of mercury contamination. Mercury is released from burning coal, and it gets into the air. From the air, it can get into the water, and it get into the fish and then get into people who consume it and then have adverse health effects. From the air it can get into the soil and get into crops and get into people who consume them and have adverse health effects. Also notice that mercury that gets into the air and then gets into the soil from the soil can get into the water or if it gets into the air it gets in the water from the water it can get into the soil. So that is a flow chart. This is a basic level conceptual model. Verbal descriptions and drawings. Any any time we put something together to try to describe, uh, especially a, a a difficult concept, would be a conceptual model. Um, our descriptions of the atom. O over the years, by the way, this changed. Scientists, you know, went from a plum pudding model to a planetary model of the atom, and so on and so forth. But those are descriptions to try to understand an atom uh, and how an atom is laid out and those are all conceptual models. Mathematical models. Um, one or more equations that represent the way a system or process works. So now we're getting into something where we can have a scientific process but we can describe that scientific process in terms of mathematical equations the math behind it, and that's a mathematical model. Uh, when there are a lot of variables, mathematical models become very important because what we can do is we can plug the mathematical models into computers and let computers run the math. Uh, a, the most common example of this today is variables that affect the weather. There, there are innumerable variables that affect the weather. If you've ever seen a weather forecast where they're trying to predict the path of a, a big winter storm or a hurricane up the coast and, and not a lot of days now what they'll do is a lot of times they'll show you know five or six different colored arrows and one arrow shows the storm going this way but the, uh, another arrow it's slightly different course the red arrow over here shows the storm going north and then out to sea um, and if you listen to what the meteorologists say they'll usually say our models are predicting and what they're doing is, in terms of weather predictions, they've got all these variables and the math behind them plugged into a computer. As they're getting the data information from their uh, you know, instruments, they're plugging that information in, and then the computer is working it and coming up with a model. And one, you know, this set of data may have say, okay, the storm's going to go this way, but the next set of data may say the storm's going to go this way, or they may have several different models working at the same time. And very often the prediction that they come up with, they say, we're pretty certain it's going to do this on these days, um, that is kind of like a, almost an average or the best model when you take all six different models into consideration. So these mathematical models are being used in, in that sense a lot today. Um, we should not make the mistake of assuming mathematical models are always right. You know, we think, well, they use numbers, they use equations, but mathematical model is only as good as the data that's being put into it. And 
the outcome or the results still need to be interpreted by the scientist. Okay? So, um, you know, think about it this way. How many times has a weatherman, as a meteorologist, made a weather prediction based on the models, which the next day ended up being completely and totally false? Meaning, we didn't get the snow, the hurricane went out to sea. Okay? So mathematical models, far, far be it from us to think that they're always right because it's equations, they're only as good as the data and the people who are interpreting them. Very important for you guys to remember. And this just states this right here. But mathematical models can be very, very useful, can create uh, unbelievable images, false color satellite images, use mathematical models, um, relating the amount of energy reflected from objects to the object's physical condition.